uh, have my own business or coach at the elite level. It was really just what I wanted to do was I wanted to be, make my parents proud and get a job for a company that would, would be a job for life because that was the messages I was getting from my parents, get with a job that's really with a big company that's going to be there for, for life. And I wanted to make my parents proud and my, my dad was a, he was a um, council worker at Leichhardt Council in Sydney. My mum worked for Colgate Palmolive, a uh, pretty humble job there. So I, was, I wanted to get a trade. So the job I, I really thought about getting and wanted to get was a, was a telecom technician because it was a trade with a big company job for life. But all that turned upside down when I, uh, my, my, da my father died uh, at the age, well, he was 45, I was actually 14 years of age. I was the oldest of three boys. And he died suddenly, had a heart attack, but he was an alcoholic, he was a gambler, and it was, and we, we were actually three of us up until the age of 12, and, and we lived in a one bedroom section of a house. Three kids, mother and father, they were all in, squashed in this one bedroom. Um, then he got a job as a caretaker for Leichhardt Oval um, as part of the council job that he was doing and we moved into a, a slightly bigger house. But uh, for me, I, it, the humble beginnings were a catalyst for me to sort of, when he died in particular, to, to, re, to, to really rethink my life and, and I suppose when he died I was really angry the fact that he actually died suddenly and, and the circumstances that he died, which I won't go into, was I didn't get the, it one, he was there one, one moment, then the next moment he was gone. I never, never saw him again because we were away on holidays when he died. And uh, cut a long story short, um, I, I did a fair bit of um, thinking. I was angry. I was getting into fights at school. Um, and it was a friend of my dad's who took me under his wing and, and had a word in my ear and, and spoke about setting some goals, which I'd never really, really done apart from wanting to be a telecom technician. And he was the person that took me aside and really sort of said, well, you know what? Yeah, you're probably a little bit smarter than that um, and spoke to me about uni and, and spoke to me about, because about, I was a reasonable footballer, about footy and, and uh, so then I started to sort of think beyond what I previously thought about and then started to, to achieve and um, then became a bit of a goal, -seeking, a goal -seeking, uh person uh, and, as I, and that's what I am today. So I suppose Reflecting back, what, there's a whole lot of lessons that, that I've, I've picked up along the way. And one of the big lessons that, that I learned is that we are all born to achieve. We're all born to succeed. That's one of the, one of the great things about um, the human race is that we are born into this world with only two fears. The fear of loud noises and the fear of abandonment. All the other fears that we have and carry around with us, we have acquired as a result of the environment that we have been brought up in. And so many of us are um, like, I, I, call, I say like circus elephants. And it was actually not far from here, there was an Ashton Circus about 10 years ago. And I took my, my uh, young my family, but was there was standing outside the circus waiting for it to start with my youngest daughter. I went to, went to walk over to these couple of elephants standing outside the tent on the grass. They had a, there was no, pre-litigation era, era, there was no fence around it, there was just a couple of elephants with a rope and a peg in the ground. And it wasn't that sturdy a rope or that sturdy a peg, I reckon I could have pulled it out of the ground if I tr tried hard enough. As I walked a bit closer, my daughter said, no daddy, the elephants will get us. But she didn't understand that the elephants were never going to go beyond the confines of the length of that rope. And it got me thinking, and the reason that these elephants would not go beyond the confines of this rope, never a, th a threat of escaping, was because they didn't think they could. They were probably that same peg and that same rope when they were younger was holding them in position. They tried to get away, couldn't get away. So they developed this belief, this, this uh, view of themselves that they couldn't break free from that rope and that peg. And so many of us are like that. The way we become conditioned as, as infants and young children uh, lays a, a pattern, of an imprint in our minds that, that is a legacy for the rest of our our days, we are conditioned uh, and under the influence of our tribe. And our tribe is that group of people, namely our parents, our peers, friends, and our teachers at a young age that, that have so much of an influence on how we see ourselves and in turn how we see the world. So at some point in time, unless we do an audit 
of the way we view the world and we view ourselves, we're never going to be any better than those belief systems that, sure, there's some great beliefs that, that are there that are driving us forward, but there are also some beliefs that are holding us back. And the way I explain it is that if we're born into this world with only two fears and we've acquired all these other fears, how does that happen? Well, when we're born into the world, imagine this room is a pristine field of wheat. That's like inside of our head. Inside of our head's a pristine field of wheat. Somebody says something to you like, you're too stupid to do that. And then somebody, and that's like somebody walking through that field of wheat once. Now, I'm not from, from the country, but they tell me that there'll be a tiny little track there that after a day or two might clear over and it's pristine again. But if somebody says, yeah, you're too stupid to do that, and then somebody else says, oh, don't be stupid, you couldn't possibly do that, then somebody else says something in, in a sort of similar way, it's like a whole lot of people walking along this track. And then what happens is this little track that would have cleared after a couple of days because no one else walked down it, somebody continually walks down it. And so that, that series of thoughts then becomes a belief. And that's how we see ourselves or how we see the world. That's how beliefs are generated. And what happens is, is you, might, you might as well be walking down the street with a lid open on the top of your head and people throwing all junk in there. Because that's how it happens a lot of the times. And that's why we, we have re repetitive patterns through generations in families. Because we, ha we have the same sort of thought processes and words being spoken about people. Sure, we have second and third generation professional people going to be really successful in some families. Then we've got second and third generation unemployed single mothers in other families, and they do happen. And I mean, that's, that's to the extremes. But all of us, myself included, have got to address and audit the way that we see ourselves at some, way, at some point in our lives. Otherwise, we're never ever going to break free of the limiting beliefs that hold us back. And those limiting beliefs operate at a subconscious level. And we can observe those by observing the behaviours and the way that we act. And I'll give you an example of how powerful limiting beliefs are. Roger Bannister, and this is probably one of the, one of the best examples, Roger Bannister was the first person ever to break the four minute mile. Right? He was, and he did that in 1954. But the way that that came about was fascinating. And what happened just after he broke it was even more fascinating. From 1942 to 1945, the record for the mile was reduced by four seconds. It was reduced from four minutes and five seconds in 1942 down to four minutes and one second in 1945. There were two Swedish runners, a, runner, a guy called Haag and a guy called Anderson that were pushing each other at all the international meets. And they brought it down to 401 in 1945, really quickly. And then it sat at four minutes and one second, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53. The longer it sat there, the more experts, and we believe experts, who, not pointed to you necessarily for you, <laughs> but we believe the experts, because experts have got credibility. Now, if um, somebody who's a financial expert or the in, in the government, we don't really believe the government do, but financial experts might say, oh, you know, the economy's going to really struggle. And we get a series of these uh, s saying the interest, interest rates are going to go up. Guess what? People don't spend any money. So then, guess what? The economy slows down because we believe the experts. Anyhow, they believe the experts, the athletes. So what happened is they didn't, they, 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 they didn't even, not necessarily not try, but they, at a subconscious level, they didn't think that they could break this record. Anyhow, it sat there for nine years. A guy called Roger Bannister, who was the elite mile runner in England at the time, he was also studying medicine. And his knowledge of the body, plus the fact that he was getting pretty close to breaking this record, hadn't broken it, but getting pretty close, he saw the relationship between the mind and that record and said, you know, if I create the right environment, if I get a big, big crowd there, if I've got a couple of pace setters in the race to push me the split times around the race, I will break the record. He affirmed publicly that he was going to break the record at Oxford University in May of 1954. He did this before the race. 10,000 people, and he did this to, to get a big crowd there. 10,000 people turned up. Massive atmosphere. And he participated in this race and smashed the record. He ran 359.6. So he smashed the record. 
But the most interesting thing about that particular episode was that it took nine years for the record to, be, to, to come from 401 down to the four minute barrier to be broken. They didn't think it could be broken. But once it was broken, within 46 days, an Australian by the name of John Landy smashed Bannister's record. He ran 358.9 and they said it couldn't be done. 46 days later, Landy went under it and then within 12 months another five athletes ran sub four minute miles. So that's the power of limiting beliefs that affects elite athletes and it affects you and me. It affects all of us. It affects, can affect us with our health, can affect us with our relationships, can affect us with our career. All aspects of who we are are driven by belief systems that we have about the world. And those belief systems also filter information, filter things. If, if something doesn't align with one of our beliefs, guess what, we can, we can sometimes be blinded to that. We may not even see that particular aspect of a person or that aspect of life or element of life. So it's really important to understand beliefs in terms of high performance. And one of the things that as a coach or as a business leader, you really need to work with is lifting the expectations, self-expectations and belief systems of the people in, in your staff or in your team. A great coach or a great boss is someone that can make their staff better than what they think they are. Make the players better than what they think they are. That, to me, that's what leadership's all about. Well, it's, it is other things that, that, that embraced and lie underneath that, but leadership once is really about you getting, your, getting, and as a parent, being a parent, being a really good leader as a parent is about lifting the expectation levels of your, of your children. And that's, it's only natural that, that um, we have fears, okay? Fears, everybody has fears. Fears are there to keep us safe. If we didn't have any fears, the human race would be extinct because we would be trying to, we, years and years ago, we would have been trying to fight lions and do all this sort of stuff. And there, but there are two types of fears. There are survival fears and there are ego fears. The survival fears are the really important ones that, that uh, stop us if I'm running late from meeting and, it's, and I need to get across George Street, stopping me from rushing across the, the road uh, because I'm gonna get killed. That's a survival fear. That's gonna keep me alive. But there's also ego fears. And the ego fears fall into a whole lot of categories. But there's two main types of ego fears that, that are really important and hold people back. They are the fear of failure and the fear of success. Too often, people are subject to this fear of failure in particular. And it was something I had to struggle with as well uh, when I was younger. And it was because I, you know, when my father died, and I was the oldest of three, three sons, what I really felt um, an, an onus on was, was to, to, to be the, fa the head of the family and to really show a good example for, the, for my brothers, which meant that I had to do everything right. So there was this, you know, I didn't want to, didn't want to make mistakes or fail. And unfortunately, the education system reinforces that. Our education system is geared to us not making mistakes. And I've been a school teacher. But what the, the messages that we pick up can be, can be, have the opposite effect, can actually hold us back. And what I've come to appreciate uh, over the years is that we need to make mistakes to, to be better. And I heard a great interview by Michael Schumacher, I think it was after he crashed off the track in a Grand Prix back in the late 90s. And he was interviewed in hospital, he broke his leg and was, was pretty bashed up. And there was a journalist that interviewed him and asked him, how, you know, how he was feeling, so he must, be he must be devastated. His response was, if I never crash, I'll never know how fast I can go. If I always sit in my comfort zone and I'm not prepared to make a mistake, then sure, I'm not gonna ever make a mistake, but I'm never ever really gonna know how much more I could achieve. And the only reason I'm not prepared to make that mistake is because I might look bad or uh, and the belief system in, his, in, in my head says that, that I learnt somewhere along the way was that making mistakes is bad. Sure, we don't want to make mistakes that are going to cost our business, but if we really want to have a successful business and have a business that's going to rise to the challenges of a changing environment out there, and the environment in the world is changing at a rapid rate, quickest time, quickest changes in history. And if I'm not prepared to make some mistake in the process of 
of trying to better my business, well, I'm going to get stuck. As a boss, as a coach, if I am not prepared to make mistakes, then I ain't going to be a very good boss or a very good coach because I've got to try things. I've got to do things differently. And I've done some pretty, some pretty uh, weird things. I suppose one of the big things that, that was quite publicly exposed was uh, when I first coached my first year of Origin, I, I wanted to do something a bit different. I wanted to get the guys out of the pubs, you know, and, and um, I wanted to, to sort of take them away because I could see the, the day coming when they were going get to them, get themselves into dramas in pubs and nightclubs and stuff like that. And lo and behold, it happened a couple of years after I, I, um, I, I had this particular origin side. But anyhow, I thought I'd take them away and do something a bit different in the media going, this is a great idea, he's getting them out of the pubs. And all this stuff. So I take them horse riding, don't I? Some people, yeah, you might remember, funny you remember that, isn't it, eh? So what I do is I take them up the Blue Mountains, right, eh? and we, we book into this eco lodge up there, and, and um, I, we, we, I think, well, okay, we're going to just do an activity, something that, have, give them a bit of fun, but we'll do it, do it as, as a group, as a team. And I invited the media along, and the media said, yeah, great idea, we'll come along as well. So what happened was the, the organiser said, oh, yeah, okay, let's all get on our horses, and we'll all go. And I said, hang on a second, aren't you going to split them into those that can ride and those that can't? Oh, yeah, I... Sp yeah, I suppose we might. Yeah, who can't ride? Uh, a couple of them go over there. Okay, you both go over there with Shirley, and then the, other, the others come with me. So anyhow, the, the other, these guys over there that couldn't ride were walking along the river, and uh, the rest of us were galloping up these hills and all that sort of stuff. Fantastic. And then what happens is, she said, we, we meet up with those that couldn't ride at some point about an hour and a half later. She says, "Right, yeah, we'll all go back together." I said, "Well, what 